Hello, dear listener, and welcome to episode 7 of the Nope Too Creepy podcast. I'm your host, Dan David. This is the follow-up of last week's Christmas-themed podcast, where we met a young man named Kenji in parts 1 and 2 of I Went Back Home for Christmas and It Almost Killed Me. Last we checked, Kenji found himself in quite the predicament. But before we pick up on that, we'll kick things off with the first story. Written by Reddit user Urban Teller and featuring fellow narrator The Seeker Alexis, I present to you Santa's Little Helper. I was six years old when I met Santa's little helper. I woke up in the middle of the night. I remember the November winds howling past the window. Of course, back then I didn't understand that those were November winds, but I knew that they were a sign of Christmas. My mom always said that Santa and his little helpers needed the wind. The reindeers, she said, ate too many sweets during the summer months, and so they needed the wind to get off the ground. Mom also said that Santa liked the snow. He always brought presents during the winter because the snow made him feel less guilty for his weight. And, of course, Santa only brought gifts because he knew that he would get Mom's homemade cookies in return. It was my dad, though, that first told me about Santa's little helpers. In retrospect, I think he might have tried to explain factory labor to me, but when he sat on my bedside and had to explain to me why Christmas was not yet, he talked about Santa's little helpers instead. He said they were many, and they were working hard to make sure all the good children would get their gifts. He always left it open whether I was good or not. But he still asked me what I was hoping to get from Santa this year. A train, I told him. I don't have a train. Oh, he said. Trains are difficult to make, you know. Santa will need to employ some smaller helpers just to make one for you. Santa's little helper. That's what he called them from then on. I want two trains, I said another night, so that they wouldn't have to be alone. Two trains? That means Santa's helpers will have to work extra shifts, my dad said. I felt sorry for Santa's little helpers. I imagine their small, thin bodies and their small wives and even smaller children and how sad they were that the little helpers would have to work extra shifts. Just like I felt sad whenever Dad had to work extra shifts. At least when Dad had to work extra shifts, Mom left my bedroom door open. When Dad came home late, he always stepped first into my room to stroke my hair and give me a kiss. If the door was closed in the morning, I knew Dad was home. Sometimes I woke up during the night. I was happy when the door was closed. When the winds got stronger and the snowflakes bigger, the door was not always closed in the mornings. I decided to ask my mom about it. Dad has to help Santa's helpers to make the trains. But he's too big, I said. He can't help with the trains. They should just let him come home. Oh, if he comes home, some children will get their Christmas presents on time. Around that time, I woke up more frequently during the nights. It might have been because of the wind or it might have been because of the draft being allowed into my room with the door being left open. Still, I insisted that my mom left the door open. I knew that a closed door meant that dad was home. 
The door should never be closed if dad wasn't home. He had to close the door. It was dad's door. It must have been very close to Christmas. I remember that mom and I went shopping the day before. The mall was really crowded and there was a Santa sitting on a big brown chair. I told him that he shouldn't make dad work so hard in his factory. I said it would be okay if I only got one train and that the other train could sleep with me so that it wouldn't be alone at night. Santa promised me that dad would come home earlier. That night, while lying awake and listening to the wind, dad came home. I didn't open my eyes because I didn't want him to know I was awake. Still, he brushed through my hair and kissed me on the forehead. He smelled foul. The door closed behind him. In the morning, my mom was cheerful. There were only two plates on the breakfast table. Does dad have to work again? Your father works hard. You want a nice Christmas, don't you? Will he be home tonight? He might be. Just you wait. I did wait. It was strange that I didn't hear the front door. Usually, I heard the clicking of his keys, footsteps, and then the door fall back into place. That night, there was no clicking and no front door falling shut. There were only footsteps. On the stairs, pausing outside my room, walking towards my bed. A hand in my hair, a moist kiss next to my eye. Foul, very foul. His breath smelled like the big metal bins at the mall. I rolled over and away from him. I didn't want a second kiss. Dad grunted. He ruffled my hair again. Then he walked outside and shut the door. Wake up, sweetie. Only two days till Christmas. I sat up and rubbed my eyes. Come on, I made pancakes. Mom? Yes, sweetie? Why does Dad smell so bad? The smile fell from her face. What do you mean? Promise you won't tell Dad? Of course I won't. She gave me a kiss. A kiss with a minty smell. His mouth smells really bad. <laughs> Maybe your father didn't brush his teeth the last time you talked. He's been very busy. When he comes home tonight, can you tell him not to kiss me? Okay. But I'm not sure if he'll be home tonight. He's still traveling, you know? I smiled. No kiss then? No kiss then. She placed her hands on my cheeks and laughed. Except for me. I didn't mind the minty kiss. That night, after she tucked me in, Mom tried to shut the door. No, I said. Dad has to close it. It will be cold. But Dad has to do it. I'm not sure if Dad can do it tonight. I pressed my lips together. Sorry, sweetie. She closed the door halfway. I'll leave it a bit open, okay? Just in case he comes. With my head half under the blanket, I nodded. But no kiss, I said. Of course, no kiss. I think it was the draft that woke me up. The footsteps followed. They were dull and slow. The way my dad sometimes walked when it was very late and he didn't want to wake me up. Dad stopped next to my bed. I felt his warm gaze on me. It made me feel safe, but the cold raised the hair on my neck. His hand ran through my hair. It felt colder than usual and it seemed to 
grip rather than ruffle. His hand abruptly left my hair alone. For a moment, he seemed to stand still. Then I felt his breath, but mostly, I smelled it. A foul, rotting smell. Like old fish in the trash. I moved my head away. His breath moved away again and the smell got weaker. There was silence, except for Dad's slow breathing. The hand moved back to the top of my head. He gripped my hair. A warm wave of rotting fish approached my face. I tried to turn away. The hand held my hair in place. The warm smell nearly touched my face. No kiss, I said. The breath stopped abruptly. The hand let go of my hair and Dad slowly shuffled backwards towards the door. I smiled. I heard him leave the room. Then the footsteps stopped. I still felt the draft. I turned to the direction of the door. Dad? I opened my eyes. The door was wide open. In the doorframe stood a small man, his head about the height of the door handle. I just stared at him. He raised his hand to his face and placed his thick index finger on his lips. Then he bent forward and his left hand touched the floor. He winked, turned on his heel, and walked down the stairs. When the morning light appeared in my room, the door was still open. Mom? My mother looked up from her pancake pan. Dad didn't come home, did he? No, sweetie. It's nice that he sent Santa's little helper. He sent who? Santa's little helper, I said. He tried to kiss me goodnight. Oh, did you dream something nice? No, not a dream, I said. He gave me my train. I held out my hand towards her and opened it up to reveal a small black and red locomotive. He put it on the floor after he tried to kiss me. My mother's eyes grew wide. The pancakes began to burn. A little while later, there were many people in the house. I knew some of them were policemen. Dad came home in the afternoon. I was happy that we spent Christmas with my grandparents. Grandpa liked my train, but Mom and Dad wanted to take it away, and they all refused to talk about Santa's little helpers. If you enjoyed that one and want to hear more from The Seeker Alexis, be sure to check out the links in the show notes. All right, everyone. Now for the finale of our Christmas special. Part three of I Went Back Home for Christmas and It Almost Killed Me. Just to refresh everyone's memory, at the end of part two, Kenji found himself smack dab in the middle of a trap set up by his psycho stalker. He was caught, beaten, and knocked unconscious, with little to no hope of getting help. The anticipation is killing me, so why wait any longer? Let's begin. I woke up feeling dizzy, disoriented, and nauseous. The back of my head was throbbing. My eyes and mouth were covered. As I reached up to try and remove my blindfold, 
I found that my hands were tied together. The feeling of confusion quickly became replaced with fear and panic. I began to hyperventilate, squirming around in a futile attempt to break free of my bonds. After a few brief moments of this, I heard a pair of footsteps approaching me at a rapid pace before the duct tape on my mouth was violently ripped from my skin. Almost immediately, I began screaming in a hoarse, decrepit voice for help. Just as quick, I felt a powerful kick ram its way into my stomach, and the sensation of whatever air I had in my lungs escaped me. Keep quiet. A deep voice stated with authority. She'll be in here soon. Don't try and talk over her, or you'll get another one. I did what I was told and decided to try and gather as much energy and oxygen back into my body as possible. Through my wheezing, I heard the sound of a door opening and the pitter-patter of footsteps approaching me. Then... I heard her voice. Good morning, my Kenji. Natalie. It all came back to me. The coffee shop. The mannequins. The guy wearing my stolen clothing. The needle being forced into me. Immediately, my confusion and fear transformed into rage. This crazy bitch set up an ambush and had me drugged. Now she had me tied up on the dirty floor of God knows where. And all because I was stupid enough to fall for her woe was me nonsense. Sorry about before, my Kenji. I couldn't risk you rejecting me if I asked you to come on your own. But I think when you- You crazy bitch! This is insane! Where am I? What did you- Before I could finish, another fierce kick to my stomach cut me off. Once again, I began wheezing, feeling small gobs of saliva fall from the side of my mouth. What did I tell you? The unknown voice barked. I assumed this mystery man was the same guy who punched me in the coffee shop. Oh, my Kenji, you can't say those things to me. I can forgive you, but Abe is a bit more sensitive about harsh language. Who's... I choked out between coughs. H who's Abe? Abe is my wonderful boyfriend. The man who stepped up when people like you couldn't. How does that make you feel, my Kenji? Why did she keep saying that? My Kenji. And what did this Abe guy have to do with any of this? N Natalie, what are you... I whimpered. I was hesitant to raise my voice or sound confrontational at this point. Afraid another kick would find its way into my gut. I heard her walk over to me each step in her heels clicking louder and louder as she grew closer. I told you we're going to have a beautiful Christmas together, didn't I? Well, unlike you, my Kenji, I keep my promises. She ran her fingers through my hair before grabbing the back of the bandana that blinded me. The sudden brightness as she removed it left me disoriented. I squinted, trying to let my eyes adjust. The first thing I saw was Natalie. She still had that crazy look on her face, except this time she was all dolled up. She had applied makeup, put her hair up into a neat ponytail and was wearing a nice red dress. I'm ashamed to admit thinking this at the time, but she actually looked pretty hot. That brief thought was quickly forgotten when I noticed the man standing over her shoulder. He was a bit less glamorous. Still donning my black pants and red sweater, 
This Abe guy looked like he hadn't bothered to groom himself for a week or so. His hair was frizzled and jutting out in multiple directions. He had a thick, unkempt beard that covered most of his face. His eyes were narrowed and staring deep into mine. But what stood out most about Abe was his size. He was about half a foot taller than me and looked to weigh about 50 pounds heavier. I would like to say that it was all fat, but this guy was clearly no stranger to the gym. Through all the commotion at the coffee shop, I had failed to notice how stretched my clothes were on him. I'm surprised he even got the pants to fit. The sweater was visibly stretched out, and a portion of his gut was protruding from the bottom. My eyes moved past my two captors and began to take in my surroundings. That's when the rage regressed once again into fear and confusion. The barren, forlorn room I laid in was adorned with strings of bright and colorful Christmas lights. Random assortments of various Christmas decorations were strewn across the floor, walls, and ceiling. It looked like a cracked out Buddy the Elf went on a decorating spree. There was no rhyme or reason to anything. The elevated cheerfulness of the decorations contrasted with the barren and bitter walls of the room in a way that sent a chill up my spine. The last thing I noticed was that the room had giant windows right in front of the place. I had a moment of hope thinking surely someone would pass by and discover this dreadful scene and I'd be saved. That moment was short-lived as I realized where we were. This building was still in the run-down part of town where I was first attacked. Judging by the state of the outside, I assumed we were even deeper in that area. The streets were unpaved, the fauna was unmaintained, and bits of trash that were blown in from unknown distances were dispersed all around. This area was virtually abandoned, and the fact that we were smack dab in the middle of the holiday season only meant a smaller chance of anyone actually wandering by. And as if all that wasn't bad enough, I noticed the door was chained up and bound by a combination lock from the inside. I was trapped. I laid my head back down to its side as I slowly began to accept my fate. I didn't necessarily think I would die, but the thought crossed my mind. Natalie had taken things this far, so what would stop her from taking it one step further and actually killing me? I hadn't told my father or any of my friends where I was going so they wouldn't even know where to look for me, if they were looking at all. All these realizations hit me like a brick as my emotions once again shifted, this time from fear to despair. Tears filled my eyes and I began to quietly sob. Natalie quickly intervened. There, there, my Kenji. Don't be sad. This is going to be the best Christmas you've ever had. And then before you know it, the best New Year you'll ever have. New Year? How long was she planning to keep me? Did she actually think she could get away with kidnapping me for that long? If I had any suspicion of Natalie being clinically insane before, this guaranteed it. I looked up at Abe whose former look of anger had shifted. He had his head slightly turned to the side, staring at the ground, and his lips were pursed into a small frown. I hadn't questioned it before, but why was he a part of all of this? If Natalie had, quote, a wonderful boyfriend, what did she want from me? I decided to voice my concern directly to him. Abe, come on, man. Why are you helping her? I'm just a dude from the past. 
What did she tell you about me? I saw Abe's head turn to meet me. His mouth opened, about to provide a response, but before he could, he looked to Natalie. She glared back at him. The look on her face was hair-raising. He closed his mouth and turned his head back to the side. Natalie took the liberty of answering on his behalf. Abe would do anything for me. He loves me to pieces. Isn't that right, hun? Abe turned his head back. A small smile cracked across his face before he replied. That's right. It was pretty clear what was happening. If I wasn't bound up in the middle of nowhere with my life quite possibly hanging in the balance, I may have even laughed. Natalie had the same hold on Abe that I used to have on her. The kind that makes you do stupid things for someone. The kind that makes you act like a fool just for the slightest chance of winning over the object of your heart's desire. The kind that ultimately transforms the wild, passionate love you have for someone into crippling, toxic resentment and hate. Abe was still in the naive, hopeful part of that timeline. I sort of felt bad for the guy before I remembered just how rough he had been with me. Just then, a plan began to hatch in my mind. A plan that could end up being my saving grace or get me killed. I was pretty sure there was no in-between on that one. But I pride myself on being realistic. I knew if I didn't try something that the odds of me dying anyway were going to rise. I took a deep breath, composed myself, and began to speak. This place, it actually looks amazing, Natalie. I saw her raise an eyebrow. Did you really do this all for me? Her eyes almost immediately lit up. Yes, my Kenji. We never had a real Christmas together, but now we finally can. Nobody's ever done anything like this for me before, I replied, doing all I can to put on a look of appreciation. Thank you, Natalie. She squealed in excitement. I knew you'd like it, my Kenji. I just knew it. You just had to give it a chance. She ran over to embrace me before sitting me up and leaning me against the wall. I looked back at Abe, who was now bearing a look of disdain. He made his way to the back of the room and began to stare out of the window. Natalie, my throat, it's killing me. You think I could get something to drink? She bit her lip, shooting me an unsure look of hesitation. I couldn't risk her second-guessing my charade. I smiled and squeaked out. Please? She returned a smile my way and turned around, walking to a cooler sitting on the other side of the room. I used the small window of opportunity I had to better gauge my situation. My feet and hands were bound in front of me with duct tape. I tried to squirm and realized that they were bound tight. No way I'd be able to simply break out of them. Sadly, this wasn't a movie that followed Hollywood physics. Before I can do any more sleuthing, Natalie returned with a glass in her hand. Here, try this. It's my special holiday punch. She leaned over and put the glass to my mouth, raising it a bit so I can drink from it. The punch tasted like a random mix of various juices with a bit of carbonation. A little sweeter than I prefer, but it got the job done. That's delicious, Natalie. Thank you. She smiled back at me. She brought the glass to her lips and took a long sip. I noticed some of the punch drip at the side of her mouth. Okay, 
I'm not exactly proud of my next move, but you have to understand, I was scared and desperate. My mind was moving at 1,000 miles a minute, and I decided to just go with it. I cleared my throat loudly, getting Abe to turn his direction back to us from across the room before continuing. Looks like you've got a bit of punch on your lips, Natalie. As I said this, I slowly brought my still-bound hands to her chin. I conjured up every bit of charm and seduction I had in me before whispering, Let me get it. Guiding her face to mine, I leaned in to kiss her. Our lips met. She began to kiss me back, her free hand on the back of my neck. Before we could finish, I felt Natalie being forcefully pulled from me. Abe had seen this, and just like I had hoped, lost his mind. He had pulled her off before punching me across the cheek. I saw stars, but my sudden burst of adrenaline kept me conscious. I watched as he began to shake Natalie, causing her to drop the glass. It broke into pieces right in front of me. A began to scream. You think it's okay to kiss him? After all I've done for you, I'm still not enough. You always bring up Kenji. Always. I'm never enough for you. He threw her back, causing her to stumble and fall. He immediately turned his attention to the decorations that filled the room. Starting with the lights, he began to tear everything down. Natalie watched in horror as she saw her plan and all the work she had put in being destroyed right before her eyes. She quickly got to her feet and ran to Abe, trying to stop him from going any further. She, of course, was no match for his strength. I knew this was my only chance to do something before Abe finally turned that anger my way. I stretched out and grabbed a piece of broken glass. I pierced the glass through the tape that bound my feet enough to create a hole. I began to pull with all my might at that hole until my feet were free. I knew I wouldn't be able to do the same with my hands and began to quickly look around for something to free them. Sadly, I was out of time. Natalie caught me trying to free myself and screamed at me to stop. She ran at me, but Abe, still furious, grabbed her by the hair and yanked her back, causing her to fall onto her back with a loud thud. He looked up at me and raised a finger before proclaiming, You're next, bitch! Yeah, I wasn't going to just wait around until it was my turn. I looked toward the door, it was still chained up. My sights turned to what I knew would be the only way out. The giant store front windows. I braced myself, took a deep breath and ran as fast as I could toward the window. With my shoulder lowered, I dove with every bit of strength I had left through the glass. Remember when I said this wasn't a movie? how this was real life and Hollywood physics didn't apply? That was never more true than that moment. The action stars always make it look so cool and graceful when they heroically jump through a glass window. They just get up, brush it off, and continue kicking ass. The truth is, glass is heavy. Even though I broke through, it felt like I had been hit by a car. Another fact? Broken glass is sharp, very sharp. I looked down at my arms. They were covered in bits of glass, and I saw blood beginning to make its way to the surface of my tattered skin. I felt the pain begin to emanate in my face, and knew it was probably not in much better condition. Lucky for me, adrenaline is a really amazing force. It can push the human body to do amazing things. I got up to my feet and made a run for it. 
I wasn't even sure where I was going. I just kept running, not daring to stop. I ran and ran until I began to see cars. I approached the road as the energy in my body began to dissipate. With one last sigh, I collapsed. When I woke up, I was in the hospital. My arms and face were covered in bandage. I looked around and a bit of panic began to set in as I recalled my final moments prior to blacking out. I saw my dad asleep in the chair next to me. He snapped from his sleep at the sound of me moving around. Immediately he got on his feet and began to calm me down. I felt my eyes involuntarily well up at the sight of him. If he was here, it meant everything was finally okay. I had no way of knowing whether I'd make it out of Natalie's trap alive, if I'd ever see my father or any of my family and friends again. I eventually calmed down and my father relayed what he was told by police to me. When I collapsed, I was lucky enough to have a few people driving along the road come out and check on me. They called an ambulance to help me. Along with the paramedics came police officers. Those officers followed the trail of blood I apparently had left back to the crime scene. As disturbing as they claimed the site was when they arrived, part of me still wishes I could have seen it. According to the reports, the police found Natalie lying unconscious on the ground. Abe, on the other hand, was still doing all he can to tear down any semblance of Christmas decorations from that room. At the sight of an unconscious girl and a large, crazed man, the police drew their firearms and demanded Abe get down. Luckily for everyone, Abe did not resist at all and was brought in with no problem. After being questioned, Abe admitted to everything, including how he was simply following Natalie's orders. He also admitted that he had lost control of himself and assaulted her. Needless to say, I felt very little sympathy for Natalie. If anything, I felt bad for Abe. He was being manipulated by her, after all. I gave my testimony to the police and made sure to let them know Natalie was behind everything. From what I heard, Abe got sentenced with two counts of assault. Natalie got sentenced with stalking, kidnapping, and assault. They are still both serving their time and have had a restraining order placed on them. At the end of the day, I was able to celebrate Christmas with my family. My dad and I were even able to laugh about it as we sipped on his own version of holiday punch, though it could be because he chose to spike his with the good stuff. Overall, it's safe to say this whole thing has taught me a lot. I'm sure you've guessed it by now, but I realize how fragile people can be. I screwed with Natalie's mind and emotions and left her broken. This ultimately led to her doing the same thing to Abe and putting my life on the line. I genuinely hope they both get the help they need and emerge from this better versions of themselves. So kids, be careful out there on your tinders and your bumbles and your plenty of fishes. You might think casually seeing someone is harmless. But you can never truly know what's going on in the head of that other person. Play your cards wrong, and you may just end up bound and gagged in the middle of nowhere, forced to spend your next holiday with that not-so-special someone. Well, there you have it. The riveting conclusion to the three-part Christmas special. I want to give one more thank you shout out to Reddit user Creative for writing parts 1 and 2 and giving me his blessing to wrap things up with part 3. I also want to thank you for listening. If we're being honest, 
This podcast has been fun to make, but has not been receiving the engagement I had hoped for. So to those of you who are taking the time to listen, I truly appreciate it. Well, everyone, I hope you have an excellent Christmas with your loved ones. If you're still itching for more creepy Christmas content, be sure to check out Nope Too Creepy on YouTube for more stories including one that will be posted on Christmas Day. Until next time, everyone, remember to stay safe out there. I'll be seeing you in the next episode.